Right now, though, uh, join us on the program, General Counsel for the National Shooting Sports Foundation, Mr. Larry Keene. Larry, how are you doing, sir? Good, Cam. How are you? I am excellent. Uh, appreciate you coming on the program tonight. Oh, happy to. All right. So, uh, first of all, let's talk about what's going on in uh, New York State. The uh, State Assembly, or I guess the State Legislative Session, is over for the year. Uh, and once again, uh, micro-stamping was not taken up by the Senate, right? Uh, that's correct. Despite a very late uh, push by Mayor Bloomberg and the Brady Center and, and uh, their allies in the New York State Assembly, uh, they passed the micro-stamping bill uh, in the Assembly, which is uh, dominated by downstate urban anti-gun Democrat legislators. And so it passed the Assembly. Uh, it was referred to the Senate, uh, but the Senate did not do anything with the bill, and, and it died when the legislature session ended uh, uh, yesterday. The interesting thing, actually, about the Assembly uh, bill is that when it was debated for over two hours, and when the vote happened, there was actually five more votes against passage of the bill this year than there were than there was last year. So they lost votes. They lost votes. So support for microstamping is actually eroding even in the New York State Assembly. Well, and, and frankly, as it should be, Larry. I, I mean, you know, look, I, I, I saw a lot of these editorials. I, I saw even a, a panel on MSNBC. Uh, talk about micro stamping, and it was painful uh, to watch because the bottom line is the technology is easily defeated in a couple of minutes. Uh, you can swap out the firing pin and completely uh, defeat the Minute. technology. Seconds. <laughs> okay, all Literally right. Literally in seconds. Okay, all right. In seconds, you can defeat the technology using uh, ordinary household tools. And again, and, you know, but the other thing, Cam, you don't even have to defeat it, it doesn't work. It, it just, just simply doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't work. It does not reliably leave legible markings on the primer of a fired cartridge casing. It just doesn't work. And so we have seen Lazat, the patent holder, mm -hmm. and his supporters you know, evolve and change their position from several years ago, like 2005, in California, when Lazat first testified, and I was there to testify against the bill, it was presented as you just pick up the cartridge casing at the crime scene and the patrolman can take out his magnifying glass, play Sherlock Holmes, read the cartridge casing, the, the markings, the make, model, and serial number right there on the street and cause a trace to be done you know, by calling it in from the radio car right. to... Uh, well, we have to have eight-digit alphanumeric codes, too. We need barcodes and gear codes as the secondary markings. Parenthetically, guess who has the patent on the barcodes and gear codes? To now, most, uh, to now um, when California was drafting regulations to implement, which they haven't done, yeah. uh, you needed to have about nine or ten shell casings so that you could piece together fragments from each of them to try to piece together the jigsaw puzzle uh, of the code to now, most recently, it's now down to a six-digit code, not an eight-digit code. And Lazat, in the most recent paper, he himself co-authored, admits it doesn't work reliably and admits that it should not be legislatively mandated at this point in time and needs further study. So apparently... The patent holder himself has come around, uh, you know, to, to our point of view on this, which is it doesn't work. It shouldn't be legislatively mandated. It needs to be studied quite substantially uh, to try to work out all of the shortcomings and flaws uh, in this concept before it would ever be something that you would consider legislatively mandating. Because the reality is if that were to happen, it's a gun ban because manufacturers – are simply not going to spend the millions of dollars that it would take to refigure their entire manufacturing process to implement a concept that doesn't work. What happens, uh, unfortunately, would be that you would stop selling handguns into that marketplace. And in the case of New York, the bill applies to used handguns as well. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, well, so it's a handgun ban. It absolutely is, uh, and you know, again, it's it's good to see that this measure is losing uh, support around the country. I know that uh, you know you guys pointed out the Baltimore Sun ran an editorial uh, suggesting that Maryland actually adopt micro stamping. Uh, Jeff Ray, general counsel and vice general manager at uh, Beretta USA, which is located in uh, Maryland, responded, and I thought uh, responded very well to that editorial as well. Uh, it's an excellent uh, letter to the editor and. Uh, you know, it's very ironic that the Baltimore Sun should urge Maryland to follow New York's lead. The, the, actually, the the only lead of New York Maryland should follow is to do what New York did, and that's to repeal Maryland's ballistics imaging system, just like New York just did. And back 10 years ago, ballistics imaging was the panacea du jour for gun crime, yep. supported by all of the same groups that now support microstamping. It cost taxpayers millions of dollars and did not solve a single solitary crime in New York or Maryland. And so why would we want to adopt the new panacea, the new, you know, whiz-bang, uh, you know, Technology that's supposed to be the cure for the for uh, gun crime when it doesn't work. And by the way, 10, 11, 12 years ago, when these same groups like the Brady Bunch were advocating that ballistics imaging was going to be the answer, people there were studies then, just like there are now with microstamping, that showed that ballistics imaging would not work and does not work. And now we see after a, a you know decade long. Failed, costly experiment. It didn't work. Let's not repeat the same mistake with microstamping. All right. We've only got a couple minutes left, Larry. I've got to ask you, um, I, I guess uh, Jesse Jackson was, was holding protests at gun stores around the country. We're supposed to anyway. I guess three people uh, the, turned up in Detroit. Four and five, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, met by about uh, 50 gun owners, I guess. You know, I, I think this is striking because here's Detroit with a very uh, a high crime rate, unfortunately. Uh, but people actually can own firearms for self-defense. They can carry firearms for self-defense. And people will use firearms for self-defense in Detroit. Uh, but, but, you know, if to me, if the gun control movement, uh, ha, you know, was going anywhere, if their arguments had, had any merit or uh, had any weight with the American people, you would have seen more than three people turn up. I, I, I think in places like Detroit and Chicago and Washington, D.C., high crime areas, uh, people understand th these gun control laws, these restrictions on, on law abiding legal gun owners don't mean a thing because they, they, they witness the violent criminals every day. Well, uh, uh, look, here's the truth. Gun control is a failed social experiment. It's time to move on, people. It doesn't work because, as you say, the only people who are going to abide by these gun control laws are the law-abiding citizen who isn't the problem. Criminals are not going to obey the law. It's sort of definitional, isn't it? <laughs> so it's not going to accomplish anything. And certainly to protest <laughs> all three of them out in, in – I mean, he couldn't even put together a baseball team or even a basketball exactly. team. Exactly. They – to protest in front of a law-abiding business that pays taxes, that complies with the law, the notion that that is somehow going to reduce urban violence in the city of Detroit is just, I mean, it's just silly. And it's, you know, I mean, insert your own adjective. It's ridiculous. You know, and as you say, gun ownership is going up across the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and as gun ownership has gone up across the United States, and not just, you know, the last couple of years. This is a trend that goes back at least a decade. Certainly it's accelerated the last few years, but it didn't start in 2008. As gun ownership has gone up over the last 10-plus years, crime has gone down. If law-abiding citizens exercising a fundamental civil liberty protected by the Second Amendment cause crime, it wouldn't be going down, it would be going up. And that's just not, not the case. So there is this demonstrably false that you know, law-abiding citizens exercising their constitutional rights somehow causes crime. You know, and if you look even at guns recovered in Michigan by police and traced, the vast majority of them are stolen, so they're not newly sold. Mm -hmm. and the vast And on average... Those firearms were originally sold at retail after the paperwork was filled out, 
after a criminal background check 12 and a half years ago, which is actually about a year and a half older than the national average. So this idea that, you know, law-abiding gun dealers complying with the law are somehow the cause of crime is laughable. Absolutely. Larry, thank you again, sir, for coming on the program. Uh, Have a great weekend and look forward to talking again very soon. You too. See Uh, you soon.